We've been building towards this for so long now. You think back to the very beginning of the very first episode, and it's beyond the wall where the White Walkers are stalking a group of rangers. So this is the culmination of one of the key storylines in, in the whole show. And this is for everything. We've been talking for a long time how the Night King's forces have been growing in power and most of the living have been kind of openly disdainful of the threat and now there's no choice but to fight it. I really love the way the first 10 minutes or so plays out because there's so much tension before there's any encounter with the enemy. Come on. You know, as much as they try to conceal it, people are terrified because this is this is death coming for them. You know, so much of it is just kind of, on one hand, setting the mood for the episode, and the other hand, showing us where these characters are going to be. The entire episode takes place in Winterfell, and you have 19 or 20 characters all involved in a very chaotic situation that needs many, many locations to service it. Because it's such a long battle in this episode, it's important that we feel the ebb and flow. And so there are moments when you think things are going a little bit better for the living. Tell them to lift their swords. We felt like it was important to have that moment of hope when Mel comes in and lights up their ox and, and they all ride off into battle. Zobria Issa says, sing not to let us. characters to feel like this, maybe this is all gonna work out. Maybe things are all gonna be okay. We've seen how devastating a Dothraki charge can be just with their regular swords. And now when they're galloping into combat with um, flaming Arox, it's, it's uh, what could possibly stand against that. What they see is just the end of the Dothraki, essentially. They have a plan, and it's important to wait for the Night King to reveal himself and then have two dragons against one dragon and a really good chance of, of defeating him. One thing that they couldn't have foreseen was Danny's reaction to seeing the Dothraki decimated. John is the person who wants to stick to the plan, but the Dothraki aren't John's. They're not loyal to John, they're loyal to Danny. And I think that Danny can't bring herself to just watch them die, and so the plan starts to fall apart the second she gets on her dragon, so he does too, and, and then we take it from there. We knew this episode was gonna be almost entirely battle, and that can get really boring really quickly. If you can watch it for a certain number of minutes before the effect starts to dampen. Part of it was making sure that we really stayed focused on the characters, and so whether it's Arya's storyline, or Sansa uh, and Tyrion down the crypt, or Jon Snow and Danny up in the dragons, kind of like all these separate little battles within the, within the greater battle. Lyanna Mormont was supposed to be a one-scene character, and then we met Bella Ramsey and we realized that we would not be doing our jobs if we kept her as a one scene character. My mother wasn't a great beauty or any other kind of beauty. She was a great warrior though. She died fighting for your brother, Rob. We knew that you can't give a, a, a big death to everybody who dies in this battle because it would have, which would have been too much. But there also, if she were to die, there was no way to, to not make a moment of it. So. That's where the zombie giant comes in. It just did add a whole level of complexity to that moment that I'm sure a lot of people would have uh, been okay with not having there if we had demanded to cut it. But I think they also understood why we needed to give one of the strongest, smaller people in the show uh, a chance to go out taking down one of the strongest, larger things we've, uh, we've ever seen in the show. <laughs> situation where people are, are fighting, Arya needs to play a central role because she's one of the best at it and she's one of the most fun to watch doing it. Even for Arya, she can't take on a, a horde of whites by herself. And especially when her head gets smacked, she's no longer at 100%. It's just 
about survival at that point. Otherwise, she's completely unstoppable and she never loses her cool and that's amazing and it's a lot of fun to watch, but it's also, it's one note. So we decided that almost rewinding the clock on who Arya Stark is to back before she became the sort of magical figure that she's become would really be interesting. It would also give us a chance to change up the nature of the story we were telling. We talked about Winterfell as kind of the home for the show, and, and uh, one of the things that always struck us as a horrific aspect of this is that these hallways and rooms where we spend a lot of good times and, and quiet times with characters that we care about has now become a horror set because it's been invaded by undead soldiers. Before that point, there's sort of an agoraphobia to the whole thing where you're in this giant, wide open space and everywhere you look, you, there's something that could be coming to kill you. Once you get inside Winterfell, everything contracts and the, the walls literally start to close in around you and something is there in the dark with you, but you don't know exactly where it is. And we thought that the pace change and the tonal change, it was really important to have that in this episode. Otherwise, the episode would start to feel would start to feel monotonous. Dracarys. We thought it was important that whatever the plan was, that it would not just work out, because that would be kind of dull. While there's no reason to know for certain that the fire wouldn't kill or destroy the Night King, there's also no particular reason to believe that it would. And then a few moments after this happens, the Night King brings them a whole new, larger undead problem by taking all of their own who have been killed in the course of this battle and turning them into the enemy. I mean, we talked about various endings for Jorah for a long time, but you know, you think about Jorah from the very first time we met him, he was with Danny. And from that time, he's been mostly by her side. Part of Jorah's tragedy is that he was in love with a woman who couldn't love him back, but he's accepted that for quite a long time. And at the same time, he was going to fight for her as long as he could and as well as he could. There had never been a moment where she more needed someone to fight to protect her than this moment. And if he could have chosen a way to die, this is how he would have chosen to die. So it was something we thought would be powerful to give him. The reason the gods was chosen is because it's such a source of power for those who believe in the old gods and for Bran in particular. So we know that the Weirwood Tree and the Three-Eyed Raven have a very deep connection. That was always the location where Bran was going to be waiting for the Night King. I just want you to know the things I did. Everything you did brought you where you are now. Where you belong. Home. It's not like the show is entirely about people redeeming themselves and then it's all over. But if, you, if the canvas is big enough, there are spaces for those redemptive moments. I think what was really important for Theon at the end was hearing that thank you from Bran, because Bran knows what's gonna happen. Theon. You're a good man. Thank you. He knows he's dead. He knows he's not gonna be able to kill the Night King. But I think what's really heroic about his action is that we're, we're all gonna die and we know we're not gonna be able to defeat death at the end. But you know, it's, it's how you face those final moments and he chooses to run straight at it. And I think he dies in a, in a way that um, makes us really proud of him and, and the journey he's gone through. For, oh God, I think it's probably three years now or something, we've known that it was gonna be Arya who delivers that, that fatal blow. She seemed like the best candidate provided we weren't thinking about her in that moment. One of the great things about having this many people you care about in a sequence together is that you can kind of pull people's attention and focus to people that they care about a lot, like John and like Danny, Theon and Bran, not to mention Tyrion and Sansa and the Crypt. So you're going all over the place with people who you're desperately worried for. and. Uh, hopefully you forget about the fact that Arya Stark ran out of that castle with the battle drums playing and going towards some purpose, and we don't know what until it happens. We hope to kind of avoid the expected, and Jon Snow has always been the hero, the one who's been the savior, but it just didn't seem right to us for this, for this moment.
We knew it had to be Valerian steel to the exact spot where the child of the forest put the dragon glass blade to create the Night King, and he's uncreated by the Valerian steel. At, at the end of it, it's it's still it's a it's a victory for the living, but at great cost because some of our favorite characters fall along the way. We knew from the beginning, once we handed the outline in, what we were in for. The directors, Miguel Sapochnik, took what we were doing and defined this episode. Miguel did a tremendous amount of heroic heavy lifting on this front. He knew that if the planning wasn't there, we never would have ended up with the consistent excellence that he delivered. It is to their immense credit that not only that they endured it, um, but that they did such a great job the whole time they were there. It's a real testament to the entire Belfast crew who gave us something that no amount of money could ever buy.